Uh, my name is Paul Meyer, and I am in Los Angeles, California. Um, and today we're talking about under the cottonwood tree. Let me just read a little introduction. Uh, I have Carlos will chime in here in a second, but it's 1949 and the sleepy little village of Algodonas, New Mexico is about to be awoken by strange magic. An enchanted cookie transforms Carlos Lucero from a boy into a black and white cat. It's up to his older brother Amadeo to find a way to change him back. Join them on the adventure of a lifetime as they unravel the many secrets of the forest and discover the true meaning of Al Susto de la Curundera. So probably a little backstory might help out. And I wrote this little essay and it's called How I Remember It. Located near the Rio Grande and, and in the shadow of the Sandia Mountains, Alameda, New Mexico provided a playground for wholesome creativity in the 1970s. Dad had a job at the General Electric factory in the South Valley of Albuquerque, which probably paid well at the time and was more than enough to provide for a family of say seven, I'm sorry, to say two or three children. But we were a family of six boys and three girls, so mom really had to stretch the dollar in our household. Alas, we paid no heed to any monetary disadvantages. Instead, we were too busy building houses in the cottonwood trees and catching crawdads in the irrigation ditches to understand the struggle. We made do with what we had, and one of the things that we had was a big backyard and the desire to harness creativity. While other families were off taking summer vacations to far off lands, we borrowed our cousin Kathleen Saavedra's state-of-the-art Super 8 camera and made silent movies about battling space aliens and landed in the backyard. One year, we made a comic book about a Chicano superhero named Caramba. Issue number one was Caramba versus Uncle Julian. I think there could have been another issue where Caramba beat the Harlem Globetrotters in basketball, but I'm not too sure. Another time, our eldest brother, Julio, led us in a constructing alien costumes with large green heads called Guma Gahambas. We performed a skit called The Band From Far Away and took our Led Zeppelin pantomiming act all the way to Hollywood to perform on the gong show. <clears throat> Finally, when I was about nine or 10 years old, I had a strange dream about a, one of the calves in the backyard. I told my brother Carlos about it and bang, just like that, we had a summer project. Soon Carlos would be taking photos of the entire family and placing each of us in little scenes to reenact the dream. Then Julio used the photos to base a drawing out of the story. After that, we would take all the drawings to the local copy shop to make photocopied spiral books. In my dream, the mysterious young boy was actually a buddy of mine from down the street named Teddy Aragon. But for some reason, we replaced Teddy with our cousin, Joey Lovato. I guess we thought he fit the part better. Sorry, Teddy. So here it is, the calf, the caterpillar, and Joey. One part literal dream, one part family project, and the very first steps that we made onto the trail and that eventually led years later to Under the Cottonwood Tree, Al Susto de la Curandera. So I'll, 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 I'll have Carlos chime in there. But so this was the children's book that Carlos wrote based on my dream and Julio drew. <clears throat> That's actually me in the front yard there running around. And from that, a few years later, in 1984, that short story was published in the Grit Dussel collection um, out of uh, Berkeley. Uh, and the, uh, it was an anthology that year from Octavia. Uh, the publisher was Quinta Sol. Actually, Carlos can chime in here after that. And then finally, years later, that story morphed into Under the Cotton Tree, Al Susto de la Cunda. Okay, I want to introduce myself. My name is Carlos Meyer, and I'm coming for you from, uh, from Albuquerque, the North Valley of Albuquerque here in New Mexico. Here, here in uh, Albuquerque, if you're a native from Albuquerque, you reference yourself as Yo soy puro buqueño. So I'm a buqueño here in the in that, You can see the adobe walls and everything. And anyway, I want to mirror off of what Paul was talking about, how, how the evolution of this book came about. We grew up in a rural area off the Rio Grande River where it was farmland, there was all kinds of stuff. I, uh, to make some money on the side, I would raise cattle. And so I, uh, <laughs> so I would go raise cattle. We had a big backyard and I would, uh, I would hire cheap labor. And the cheap labor were my younger brothers. <laughs> did I, did I ever, I don't know if I ever paid him any money, but I used to, no. <laughs> But they used to help me with raise the cattle. I would raise them, and then I'd take them to the sell bar and sell them. But one time they got out, and 
Paul, they got back in. So Paul had a, a dream about it. That dream, he wrote it down. I wrote it down. And at the time I was, uh, I was a student at New Mexico, here's my shirt, New Mexico Highlands University. It's a, it's a Hispanic college in Northern Mexico. And I got a degree in mass communication. So at the time I was, I was there writing and I said, well, I, man, this will make a fantastic story. So my brother, my older brother, Julio, and I wrote, I got together and, and uh, I did the story and he wrote the pictures. In fact, here's one of the original pictures from it. Here's all nine of the, the brothers and sisters. You probably can't see this very good, but the, that one in the middle, that's Paul as a young guy, 12 years old. <laughs> that's the, he's the youngest. But we shopped it around and at the time, people were not picking up Hispanic Latino literature, nobody. We shopped it in New York and this small publishing outfit, we knew that Rudolph and I, in fact, Rudolph and I lived kind of by us and uh, we knew of a place that published his stuff, Keep the Soul. So we took it to Keep the Soul and they, like Paul said, they published it. And that got the whole ball rolling. In the meantime, I, I decided to write a screenplay of this in at New Mexico Highlands University. So that's when Paul came back in and we polished it back and forth, polished it back and forth. And the final collaboration is this. To, I guess, uh, take off from where Carlos was last stopped. So he owes me money for taking care of the calf. Um, and, and so flash forward from the 1970s to being in LA, um, myself pursuing entertainment, acting. Um, if you blinked, you may have missed me playing a mugger on General Hospital one year. Um, <laughs> so there I was and I was thinking, well, why, why don't I just do my own stuff? Why don't I create my own um, stories? Because it's all about storytelling, right? So if you're acting, you're telling one part of a larger picture, but when you're writing something, you're telling the whole story, right? So I took Carlos's screenplay that he polished at uh, New Mexico Highlands University. Um, then I, we, we went back and forth, collaborate, collaborated on it. Um, we took it as far as we could, we thought, because we had it actually greenlit for a $3 million budget at one production, particular production company. We had a uh, lead actress lined up, a, um, um, a lead, a director um, attached. It's in Hollywood, it's all about attachments, right? So we're attaching the, the, these names. And then one day that deal fell apart and it's heartbreaking, but we think, well, what could we do on our own? And we thought, you know what? <clears throat> if you make a graphic novel or a comic book, it is the whole movie, right? So um, I, uh, I, I just, okay, so I'm gonna direct. And I'm gonna find myself a, someone to collaborate with who was Margaret Hardy. And she was the actors, the lighting, the sound, the special effects, all of the above. So we would sit down. She actually only lives a few miles away from uh, me in, in Los Angeles. And we'd sit down and we'd collaborate and we'd sit and we and we'd go through each picture and we'd say, or each panel and we'd say, all right, I want uh, Amadeo to be at the fence and Jose the rat on the bottom. And it, it, was, a, it was a fun collaboration because it's comic books and graphic novels, it's, it's a collaborative medium. You can't, you, you need more than one. Well, actually, I guess they're all, there are do it all people, but that's not me, I can't draw. So uh, thankfully we got on our team, Margaret Hardy, uh, took to the next level. We did a raising, uh, we raised money in Kickstarter last year uh, and we're all set to go for a book tour. We're gonna, this was gonna be one of our stops at SoulCon in, in, um, in uh, Columbus. And uh, we got all of our books for sale, ready, ready for sale. And then COVID hit and everything shut down. And we had, we had all these events lined up and now we're like, we just fingers crossed, we can actually meet people again next year, 2021, we'll see. <laughs> so I wanna just uh, take it a step up as we got the book, but we, we wanted to make sure that it was, uh, it met the caliber of other graphic novels around the country. So Paul, uh, the International Latino uh, Book Awards, 
got wind of our book as an advanced reader's copy. And uh, surprisingly, well, it was cool because I got the invitation. Paul says, come over here to L.A. And so I went to L.A. and we went to the conference. And what was cool is uh, when they started the conference, the, the, people, the lady that, that was speaking, the first thing she did is this, okay, I want to know all the, if you're from Latin America, from Spain, there's a lot of people from Spain there, from Spain, from different countries. And here I was, there's only like two or three from New Mexico. <laughs> but here I rose my hand, I'm from New Mexico. But when we won the, the graphic novel, for us, it was an emotional moment. We, we beat a guy from Spain, so that was cool. <laughs> but anyway, but it was cool when my, my brother gave tribute to my mother. My mother, if you know the evolution of the, the culture of New Mexico, we were of the transitional generation, mostly just Southern Colorado, Northern New Mexico. It just, it was Spanish because it was settled by the Spanish. So my mom, even though she was right close to the Colorado border, that's where she was born and raised. She was born in a place, a little town called Ancho Chico. Her first language was Spanish and she had to learn English, but she wasn't down, she was in by Northern New Mexico. But what was cool was Paul, during the International Latino Book Awards, he gave tribute to my mom. This is a story about, so what is culture? Culture is time and place and the people, right? So in Northern New Mexico, Southern Colorado, you have an isolated group of these villages that spoke Span only Spanish up until probably the 1950s and then English transitioned in. Um, so our mom was one of those uh, that he, she grew up in Anton Chico and then eventually she moved to the big town of Las Vegas, New Mexico, which was uh, probably 14,000 people and you could fit the whole town into the Staples Center. <laughs> so, and that's where she met uh, our dad, uh, Julius Meyer. So I, we, what Carlson and I were trying to do is, is exactly what Rodolfo and I did, what Nasario Garcia does now, um, and captures a time and place. Um, so we're trying to, trying to capture a time and place of northern New Mexico and, of course, add fantasy to it and, and excitement uh, that the children can, can, can grab onto. A high interest concept is what they call it. But Mark Twain captured a place in time in rural Mississippi, and he captured the Mississippi Valley. If Mark T Twain was alive, he would have made a graphic novel like ours. So ours, ours is in an entertaining and graphic novel version is capturing the Rio Grande Valley. And I want to distinguish because there's a lower Rio Grande Valley, and that's in the Texas region, but we're in the upper Rio Grande Valley. That's the where the Rio Grande starts in Colorado. The Rio Grande River starts, and so that's where we are. So we were, we're basically uh, capturing a place and time in graphic novel. A lot of people, the older generation from New Mexico, they're relating to it because a lot of the words, we use a lot of the, the Spanish words, like uh, there's a word here in New Mexico called, uh, it's sapo. And I'll just, uh, just to give you a highlight, sap, and here in New Mexico, the word sapo means something different, literally, than what it means. Because uh, literally, sapo means a toad or a frog. But in Mexico, we use it as being lucky. So sapo means you're, you're being lucky, but you'll have to read the book to, to know why. <laughs> Finding your, your little area to be your own and, and you find yourself and to tell your own story, right? You, you want to be able to tell your own story. And that's what Carlos and I are doing in Under the Cottonwood Tree. We're telling our regional story, our colloquialisms, or our Spanish words that, that are used, has, have different meanings in New Mexico than they do with my compadre who was born in, in Tijuana. His Spanish, there's, there's little words that don't translate completely. Um, and we're celebrating the differences without putting the other differences down, you know what I mean? It's, it's like, this is who we are. And, and um, we're not saying we're, we're, we're better, we're saying we're different and let's celebrate that. But I, I, when I was a kid, I wasn't, I, I couldn't find, 
I think I had ADD. I don't think I was ever diagnosed with it, but I think I, it, I, I couldn't really have attention here or there. And I found myself gravitating towards the libraries because I couldn't, I, I wasn't the best at sports. So I wasn't, I, I wasn't playing basketball or soccer like the other kids. I, tr I did, but I wasn't the best at it. So I would find myself in the libraries finding my little place, my little area. And then I wasn't even where the cool kids were in the library because they were reading novels while I was over here reading comic books. Uh, and I'm like, so it's, but for me, that was a little escape. That was a little, um, um, I could, I could sit and read a comic book and I, I, I had a great, I had a great day um, where other kids were in the library reading novels while I, but what I'm trying to say is, Comic books are just as worthy as, as those novels. They can be a stepping stone, um, as my, as TG, uh, <laughs> well, sure, this is TG, uh, my lovely cat. Um, comic books can be a stepping stone or you can stay there and, and that's great. Um, um, I, I think, I, think I, I wrote, it's, it's ironic that I, that I started off in comic books and then worked my way around back into them, I think. Uh, I, I wrote a little, I got a report one year when I was uh, probably in fifth grade and, and horrible student again, because I think I had ADD. Um, but here's a little report I did. If you're looking for a fun hobby, consider comic books. Just look at all your choices. You have <laughs> villains fighting superheroes, um, hilarious, funny characters, and all sorts of space adventures. And don't think you have to be a kid to read comic books. Adult comic books are popular too. You can also consider them investments. <laughs> comic books can become very valuable in their old age. Okay. You're having a boring day? Just pick up a comic book and be transported to wherever your heart desires. So that's where my mind was in when I was a little kid. Um, yeah, I, I think it's, we want to continue this story with Under the Cottonwood Tree. Um, so there are other uh, projects on the sidelines. Um, one actually uh, for myself and my, and my partner, uh, JC Crawl out here in Los Angeles, is, is a comedy horror comic book called Sod about, it's Tremors meets Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. So it's comedy horror about a small town who's being overrun by carnivorous Venus flytrap slash your front lawn um, hybrid. So it's, it's comedy horror. Uh, we're, we have two more issues to go and then we're going to turn it into a, um, into the graph, into a graphic novel. Um, and then for Under the Cottonwood Tree, there is, um, number two, uh, in this adventure is going to be, we, right now working title is Under the Cottonwood Tree in the River of Time. Um, so we find our kids going back in time and having an adventure in, um, New Mexico in the 1500s or 1600s, we haven't decided. To. And then it's all, the third book is all about them getting, coming back to uh, our, our time travel. And I believe we're gonna call that Under the Common Tree and the Seven Cities of Cibola, but we're not sure yet. Um, so that is under the, that's, that's what we're, we're, so it's hard to work in an environment that it's like, it's, well, I'm too busy, it's, it's, in this COVID environment, it's kind of, it's very distracting. I don't, I don't feel like, like I can't, hey, let's, let's work on this project because, well, the world is in chaos right now. I don't feel like working on stuff, but um, eventually we'll get there. Uh, but I, I want Carlos to, this, uh, Carlos is going to talk about Mighty Souls Monsters. I just want to mirror a little bit off of what Paul was saying about, because uh, these, uh, I call them Chamacos, there's Carlos, Amadeo, all these characters in the, the, the book, they have a lot of ventures left. Whenever we go to these podcasts, they're always asking, wow, what are they going to do next? What are they going to do next? So just as Paul said, we've got two versions going, and I'm, I'm writing down a bunch of uh, plot points as Paul is. And, uh, but I do want to, uh, we do have other projects going under the North Forth publication umbrella. And one of them is, is a, a children's book called uh, Mighty Souls Monsters. 
and it was written by myself and my daughter and her name's Mike Soul. Like you, <laughs> she just now, and it's, it took about six years to write and it's, it comes from an emotional backstory because, because I, I'm, I'm a widower and Marisol lost her, her mom. And so it basically is, is a love story about that, but in monster form, <laughs> if I could say that in monster form. So, so she just now graduated from uh, the university of New Mexico. And, uh, I'm kind of, for me, it's kind of sad, but she says, guess where I'm good going dad. And I said, oh, where are you going? You're probably going to go to Colorado or LA, New York. No, Dad, I'm, I'm going to go to Spain for a couple of years. No, don't go to Spain. <laughs> She's August 23rd. She just got married. So her and her husband are taking off to Spain, and they're going to be there. And while she's in Spain, she, she's going to be illustrating the book. So, so we're going to, hopefully we'll get that done. And that's, uh, it's, it's, it's a love story about monsters. How's that? <laughs> that's Albuquerque public school systems. They have a program. It's called Lavador Libros for, because of this COVID situation, they pick a person from the community to read a book. And I was thankful that they picked our book. So city councilor, Albuquerque city councilor, Brooke Brasson, read our book on the country. So if you want a taste of a New Mexico fairy tale, go to YouTube, Google Labrador Libros, Brooke Bassan, and she'll give you a taste of our culture here in New Mexico. Sorry. Please go to underthecottonwoodtree.com or utctbook.com. And when you click on there, you can actually watch some fun videos. Uh, we had Brooke Brasson read our story to some children uh, for the Lavender Libros in Albuquerque. Um, and you can purchase there. You'll be able to either purchase a digital, a uh, soft cover, or hard cover of our book. And, uh, and PayPal it. And we'll, mailing is free in, in, this, in, this, in this time of COVID. So um, it may take a little longer, but it'll get to you. Um, and uh, yeah, under the cottonwood tree .com.